next year, but next time around, we'll be better. <laughs> Are you a longtime fan? Uh, since uh, Jerry Rice days back uh, in there. Did he still maybe want to play? Quite a while. Bit a bit. That's bit. Yeah, that's a, quite a bit. <laughs> You're not a fair weather friend. I'm just just checking. Sometimes there there was a, there was a season of a couple of fair weather friends there a few <laughs> years ago. Yeah, well, well, a lot of people chose chose the the, uh, the Cowboys because they, they like to the star on the helmet, you know. But uh, you know, you got you got you got to pick a team and stay with them, even if they up or down. You got to stay with them, you know. And then you can you can kind of go back and, and look at other teams, but at the same time, you still got your main team. So that's why yeah. I, I got my main team. You're a diehard. I can respect that. Thank you. <laughs> my dad and his wife are uh, 49ers and a Cowboys household. So uh, they have some serious rivalries going on, but they usually manage to at least try and get to at least one game a season when they're allowed to go. And it is, uh, it is definitely a split household. Yeah, well, uh, for the longest, uh, I was a, a 49er fan. My wife was, was a, a Cowboy fan. And uh, she finally kind of came around a little bit. I think she, she, she's a 49er fan now. <laughs> oh, my. You converted. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, I, th I think in, in, the, in the whole sense of the thing, you know, she really was just picking the opposite team not pick just to keep, keep a rivalry going in the house. And, uh, it makes it makes for fun fun family gatherings as long as it doesn't get too doesn't get too testy. Yeah, well, we're not going to take it to that extreme. We we just kind of enjoy the game and, and hope 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 you know they, they play a good game. There you go. But so for those of you just joining us, thank you so much for signing on to. Uh, watch and or participate in the AV617 meeting for the Stockton community. We're going to get started in just a few moments as we allow everyone to log on. Thanks again for joining us this rescheduled meeting uh, from January 6th. Hannah, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and sharing the screen with the renaming instructions. And those of you that are waiting for your colleagues to join, uh, feel free to go ahead and rename yourselves. Uh, make sure that your screen name reflects your name and your organization and what your status is on this committee as a CSC resident, uh, CSC member, a uh, CARB uh, representative or an Air District representative or another agency if you are part of another organization. We'll begin our meeting in just a few moments. We, we do expect to have uh, quite a few number of people on this a Zoom call today. So if you wouldn't mind muting yourself while you are not speaking, we would appreciate it to minimize the background noise for everyone involved. Thanks again. and Kim, I will ask for your help to let me know uh, if and when our, if Douglas joins. I want to make sure he is synced up to the interpreter um, and maybe we'll get started in a minute or so, but I want to make sure that uh, when he does jump on that he has access to Mark. Eric, I don't Good evening. See. Go ahead. I don't see Douglas on the line yet. I don't either. So I think we might get started without him. And I will just ask you both if you can keep an eye out for him joining. And if he does, feel free to interrupt me uh, so that we can make sure he gets uh, connected to our fantastic interpreter. We will. Thank you so much. 
All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. You are uh, attending the uh, meeting for January 14th of the AB 617 Stockton Community. This is the steering committee meeting that was originally scheduled for last Wednesday, and we have rescheduled it for today. So you will see that the meeting number is 13A. My name is Erica Manuel. I'm the CEO of the Institute for Local Government, and I am glad to lead the facilitation team for this community, along with my team members, Hannah and Kim. Hannah and Kim should be waving right now or giving you some kind of signal. Um, they are there to help you throughout the night with any problems you might have with this meeting. Uh, we are trying to make sure that your virtual experience is as seamless as possible. And then as a team, we'll be facilitating this conversation to make sure that your process not only runs smoothly from a technical standpoint, but also that a wide variety of community voices are heard tonight and incorporated and that you're successfully reducing emissions in Stockton with your service. So we were, again, originally, yeah. Douglas just joined us. Perfect. Let's get Douglas scheduled and set up with his interpreter. We're going to stop the screen share and give him a chance to uh, find his, uh, his interpretation and then we'll continue. Hey, Douglas, are you all set? Not yet. See, I, I guess, yes. yeah, I'm all ready, ready on. Okay, I'm all good, thanks. Awesome, no, I'm so good to see you and we're happy that you're all hooked up. We will move on and continue with our agenda. Okay. So the last full meeting. Erica, you're on mute. So sorry, I don't know how that happened. All right, so um, as I was saying to myself, <laughs> the last full meeting that we had uh, of this community was actually in December. And what we, uh, what we attended and talked about, for those of you that attended, was a really good discussion about the SERP. And we made a lot of progress. We allocated and we prioritized items for that SERP, and we had a really candid discussion about timing, what needs to happen and by when. We also approved an extension letter to CARB so we can spend a little bit more time on the SERP and make sure that the group has enough time to achieve the consensus that you need on what the items are that need to be in the document, what you want to include. Um, as I've mentioned before, AB 617 is a community-driven process. That was how it was designed. And so our goal and the goal of this, uh, I think, of the original legislation is to really hear from you and develop a SERP that reflects your priorities and your voices. But as you know, this community is not homogeneous and, and there are lots of voices and lots of perspectives to consider. So the process itself is what I like to think of as beautifully messy, but creating art, right? The end result's gonna be great, but you might get your hands and your clothes dirty in the process while you're kind of collaborating as a group of you know, 20, 30, 40 of you on each of these calls. And it's even messier with COVID and social distancing and virtual meetings, but we do have a plan. And so with that in mind, we've sort of developed the attached agenda that's gonna be showing on your screen in just a second. The intent here is to honor your time um, and to honor the process. And so we're going to start on time and end on time tonight. And we've heard over and over again from our committee members that you really do like structured meetings that um, have a good start time and end time. So we're gonna try our best to stay within the time frames noted on the agenda today. And if I do ask you to move along quickly, it's not because I mean, but it is because I do want to make sure we respect the requests that we've received from some of your committee members. On the agenda tonight, we have a quick icebreaker discussion to kick us off. And then we've got a presentation from your community co-host, and then we're going to move right into the CERT measure review. Uh, the last thing we're going to do is the CAMP, which is the Community Air Monitoring Plan and how we're gonna make sure we continue to prioritize the verbiage in that camp, even though the number one urgent goal for this committee right now is to get the SERP done. So we didn't want to discount any conversations about the camp. We heard in a few meetings prior to this one that that was important. And so we wanna reflect that, but we also have a kind of a ticking clock on getting our SERP done. So we're gonna try and do both things uh, today and mainly set up a, a framework for us to work concurrently and on a parallel track moving forward. So that's the agenda. Uh, we have had numerous Zoom meetings, and so we're gonna dispense with the logistics of Zoom for the sake of time. So 
the biggest reminders are to make sure that your screen name is accurate and we are happy to help rename your screen a name if you need. If you're in the stipend program, you need to stay in this meeting for 75% of the meeting to get credit for it. And that's another reason why we like to try and start on time and end on time so we can kind of keep track of those minutes and hours. And then uh, another note is that you may have noticed that this meeting is being recorded and there will be public comments noted at the end. Uh, these CSC meetings are always open to the public and we're grateful to those public members that participate via Facebook throughout the evening. And if you would like to make a comment or pose a question on Facebook, you can submit that via Facebook or to the AB617 at valleyair.org email address during the meeting. And that will be addressed during the meeting's public comment period. Uh, Facebook Live will end when the meeting ends, but as always, if you have additional questions uh, from the CSC members to CARB or the Air District, certainly we are happy to take those after the fact. So we will dispense with any of the additional logistics and we will move it to our community co-host and our Air District host for their welcome before we discuss the other elements of the meeting. I would love to ask Ryan uh, to kick us off with, a, and Irene to kick us off with a host and co-host welcome. Yeah, just, uh, you know, happy New Year, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the flexibility you showed last week and completely understood the, the, the desire and the need to, to move the last week's meeting and um, thankful that everybody was able to reschedule and, and be in attendance tonight um, so we can continue the, the, the important uh, work and, and looking to, to get this, uh, the, the, the items in the CERP. And, and so I just, Want to thank everybody once again, and really looking forward to Irene and and talking a little bit about her experiences in the in the, the Stockton AB six one seven community. So thanks. Thank you. Turn over and to then, Irene. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm uh, the community co-host. Uh, my name's Irene Kalimlam, um, representing Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, and very um, excited to be helping co-host and um, doing a short presentation today. And I'll go ahead and turn it back. Thank you, Irene. We're so happy to have you as our co-host and uh, uh, to really uh, give us a download on some of the work that you're doing in Stockton. And, and one of the things that I think you all uh, didn't have the benefit of because COVID came so quickly after this group was assembled is that you really didn't get a chance to connect with each other in person very much. You had maybe one meeting, maybe two, before we were sheltered in place and learning Zoom. And so uh, we are and do try to incorporate uh, community voices into every meeting. Uh, Irene's going to give a presentation in just a second. And one thing we thought might be kind of fun uh, at her request and at the committee's request was to also maybe spend a little bit of time getting to know each other with a quick poll today. Uh, and in the spirit of the new year, we have a New Year's poll for each of you. So for those of you that are on the uh, computer or even on your phone and tablet, you should be able to see poll questions that Hannah's going to launch in just a second. Very frivolous, very fun, really innocent, but we wanted to know did you make a 2021 New Year's resolution? Some people said with because of COVID, they were not bothering. Other people were very much interested and thought we're at new start. It's a new year. Let's, you know, kick 2020 to the curb. What about you? What was your plan for this year? Did you make a New Year's resolution? Yes or no? Uh, go ahead and vote and submit that. We're just curious. And, and anyone on the line can submit, um, even if you are with the Air District or CARB. Okay, we're just waiting for a couple more people to vote and you guys results are very interesting. I'm going to go ahead and end the polling with the first question and show you the breakdown. Voila. Oh my goodness, 50-50. That actually sounds about right for those of you um, that didn't do it. This is, I think, the year that I heard the most people just were not into it. Um, and others felt like it's a tradition they had to keep going. Um, we do have a follow-up question though, for those of you that did uh, that did go ahead and do those resolutions. What did you decide the resolutions needed to be? Your primary categories, right? Let's say you had your number one. Was it diet and exercise? Was it mental health, wellness and self-care, career and business focused, financial health or some other category? And uh, for those of you that said no, you can go ahead and click, I did not make a resolution. No judgment here. We're just curious to know kind of what the categories of that were given 2020 was a bear, right? So what do you do in 2021 when you're still maybe sheltered and probably a little stressed too? 
We're gonna give it another five or six seconds for you guys to make your choice. And I'm gonna share the results in just a moment. Most and if of any one of you at the end of this poll wants to, we'll take one comment. If somebody wants to tell us what your resolution was, we will gladly accept uh, someone's uh, insights on maybe what they chose. I can tell you personally, I was one of those people that did not make a resolution this year. I, uh, I've been holding off. Looks like a lot of diet and exercise, but the number one was mental health, wellness, and self-care. I can totally see that. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and there's a lot of others in diet and exercise and other actually kind of a, a tied, if not to other getting more of it. Does anyone want to tell us, just unmute yourself and tell us what your resolution was, if you feel like it's either funny or maybe inspirational for those slackers like me that didn't do a resolution yet? Irene, did you do a resolution this year? Yeah, mine was definitely in that mental health, wellness, self-care category. Um, so definitely I had on mine just journaling a lot more to try to unload any sort of like thoughts weighing on me um, and to get them on paper. Definitely. Yeah. And it looks like Jonathan said self-care for sure. I think a lot of people might have had that even if an unofficial resolution was just to kind of keep keep above the fray and make sure that you had, uh, and Regina, self-care and wellness, absolutely. Just kind of keep your mind right. It could be meditation. It could be yoga. It could be journaling. It could be just taking some time and space. Um, appreciate that candor from all of you. And um, it is a new year and it is a, a, a whole new, um, a lot of changes have already taken place in 2021. Feels like it's been a lifetime already. It's only been two weeks, but um, we do appreciate you taking time with us today and, and indulging us a little with that New Year's question. Um, and with that, we will actually turn it over to our community co-host to tell us um, about her work and what you've been doing in Stockton and help you hopefully give us a little, little New Year's inspiration as we move into this 617 planning tonight. Thanks, Irene, you're up. All right, thank you. Hopefully I can live up to all of those things. Again, I um, wanted to do action. Um, my name is Irene Kalimlam, um, and I know like from some of the other presentations earlier, there um, has been talk about like redlining and just the little vanilla neighborhood. And that's actually um, where I grew up um, in Stockton. And um, since then, I've gone on to um, get um, my BA in public health um, and then also a master's in um, city and regional planning and public health. And I think um, a lot of my focus in the work that I'll be sharing is just trying to bring in um, more community voices into planning processes around health and environment. Um, so for this, it'll be um, a presentation where I'll be sharing out a report that um, we recently put together on just the environmental justice work. And hopefully some of it, um, I'm gonna be trying to tie into the process that we're going through now in the um, SERP and the camp. So I'll go ahead and share and Make sure this is in full screen. All right, so um, the report that we put out, it's called um, Greenlining the Hood. Um, it's, uh, um, I work with Fathers and Families of San Joaquin and it's centered around our campaign to bring in healing, reimagining and reinvesting um, into Stockton spaces. And so I wanted to maybe first go into the mission of fathers and families and then um, going into our health focus and then what our campaign's about. So first with Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, um, it's a local nonprofit in Stockton um, that's a racial justice centered organization and their mission is to promote the social, cultural, spiritual, economic, and environmental renewal of the most vulnerable families in Stockton and the greater San Joaquin County and the populations um, that they really center a lot of their services around are youth and particularly systems impacted youth. So youth that are impacted by foster care or school push out or incarceration, as well as um, reentry population and then families that are impacted by violence and trauma. Um, and they, they specifically have a Stockton Trauma Recovery Center to be able to provide free mental health counseling to families impacted by trauma. Um, but specifically uh, myself, I 
uh, represent the health and environmental justice programs. And um, with what we're trying to do is reversing the harm and extraction of um, natural resources and restore healing and regeneration to the environment. Um, and so we're really focused on trying to um, bring in more green into Stockton and um, build environmental stewards, especially um, with youth and build their voice for advocacy. And um, we have a, a, a main initiative called Greenlining the Hood, and it's a kind of a play on the word of redlining, whereas we heard from previous uh, presentations how redlining was taking opportunity away from um, communities of color and about bringing in hazards or um, lack of investment in neighborhoods. And with greenlining, it's kind of a reverse on that in both um, bringing in more urban greening um, and green spaces into neighborhoods that have been historically redlined, but also um, bringing in like more investments into that same community as well. So um, just to kind of go back. Um, so some of the, the intention of this report is uh, we conducted a series of different projects um, working primarily with youth and some of our participants. Um, and we are hoping that this report can inform, I guess, number one, the efforts that we've been doing to build youth leaders and um, bring in urban greening into South Stockton neighborhoods. Um, but I think also, which can speak to um, public agencies is, is show different ways to engage the community and do experiential learning to um, be different methods of community engagement. Um, and so we'll be going over just some of the different methods that we did to try to um, engage the community in um, ways where they're learning and also gaining experience. So the, um, these are the different activities that we did over the course of the past two years. And I'll be going into each one, one by one. Um, so the first was an environmental justice workshop series, which was conducted with youth. Um, and with them, we also did photo voice and teach them how to um, test for their air quality. Um, we also did some community beautification efforts with things like tree planting and community cleanups. And then um, as part of the research process, uh, we did some dial intergenerational dialogues where our youth interviewed elders to get their perspective on the environment and how they've seen things change. Um, and then just about um, trying to get people familiar with the planning processes that are happening in the city. So that would include things like transformative climate communities and then AB 617 as well. All right, so, um, so this one, um, this part kind of goes over our workshop series. Um, we were able to do a first cohort in 2018, and then um, this shows some of our workshops in 2019. And we were just trying to teach them a lot of different topics. So um, just around things like redlining, understanding Cal Enviro screen, um, looking at different environmental justice leaders and seeing like how they've held their campaigns. And um, as I said, like a big part of what the youth found really valuable from these workshops was um, being able to go out into their neighborhoods and take pictures of things that they identified that they were concerned about in their environment. Um, and with the photo voice too, they could also take a pictures of things that, that they found beautiful or things that they wanted lift, to lift up that was good in their neighborhood. And um, what we had wanted to do with this photo voice map is it's also um, the youth collecting stories, but in a way it's also data that can be presented out to public agencies on areas that they found of concern. And I, um, I like how in AB 617, we kind of did a similar process when we had our maps and we're identifying different areas where we wanted to put the air monitors because those are the areas that we identified as concerns. So I actually wanted to zoom out of the presentation and show um, some of the photo voice um, points that they put on the map. And um, this was even before the AB 617 process. So um, some of it is, is relevant to some of um, the measures that we had been asking for. But for example, um, I can try to see. 
the picture I is took it kind was of a, a green ocean. Is the volume really low still, or is it okay? I can try to zoom it out on here if it's too low. Green, green ocean. Um, the picture I took was of the green ocean, which is not the natural color. And um, because of all the trees at the end of the port, there was um, it doesn't make sense. It should it should come once a month and try to clean the ocean. It, it maybe it won't look as green as it is now. So if you didn't hear that very um, loud, I guess you can also see the quote on here where he said, the picture I took is of the green water, uh, which is not the natural color because of all the trash at the end of the port. It doesn't make sense. They should come once a month and try to clean up the water so it wouldn't be as green as it is now. So that was a perspective of one of the youth that wanted to go to the port. And some of these are videos. Um, some of these are pictures that they took, but they all have the quotes on their reflection on what they wanted to communicate about that picture. Um, and I'll go ahead and try to see if we could just do one more example. The reason why I took a picture of this dry area and polluted area is because something caught my eye. Students have to go to this part, this bus stop over here, and to get picked up looking at all this. That's crazy. I feel like we should change that and put plants and more of a green area and like a reason to live in Stockton, to breathe in good air, good quality air. So again, this youth was, um, I think this is an area that was a vacant lot over by Rancho San Miguel and Airport Way. And was just noticing that it was like a very dry area. Um, there was just a lot of trash there. And there's a bus stop right next door. So you just talked about a lot of students that have to walk through that area to get to the bus and they're looking at a polluted area and it can make them feel negative about their neighborhood. Um, and he had said that maybe putting more plants or more of a green area um, can give people like a reason to live in Stockton and they're breathing clean air. So that's just some of what I wanted to share uh, just from the photo voice and some of the youth perspectives we had and I'm going to try to go ahead and go back to the presentation. Um, okay, and then we also conducted interviews with 10 elders and we held two focus group, one with a group of youth and one with a group of uh, re-entry um, participants. And with the elders interviews, uh, the youth were mainly asking them um, can you describe your neighborhood environment and how have you seen um, your neighborhood change from when you were younger to, um, to what it is now? Or also asking them, well, where are other places you've lived and what are the neighborhood conditions like um, in those areas? And um, with some of the quotes, um, let's see here. So we had some, um, of our participants just talking about the stark differences in um, the trees in South Stockton versus how they are in the North. Um, a lot of people, so we also had, um, yeah, around 50% of the elders we interviewed that cited a lack of trees in their neighborhood. 67% um, of them that were concerned about um, high air pollution. And then, um, yeah, so those were some of the, the, the perspectives shared by our elders and, and things that they had identified that they wanted to be done to improve the environment. Um, like 44% talked about like maybe teaching more around recycling or bringing in recycling programs, um, participating in gardening. 33% um, identified the need to address clean water and to bring in more clean water. 44% um, of them mentioned wanting to cl clean up air pollution um, and then 33 to shift to more solar energy and clean cars. So these are different things that are um, aligning with some of the different SERP measures that we have seen. And then um, when we had the roundtable discussion, I think one thing that we thought was interesting that came out of um, our COVID period was around the wildfires and how it was made aware that um, a lot of the workforce for, um, for mitigating wildfires came from um, prison labor and with them not even being paid a dollar uh, an hour wage um, and with 
formerly incarcerated, they might be getting exposures to a lot of these different job paths, but when they re-enter society, um, they're blocked from getting um, a range of jobs just because of having that, um, having that record on, their, on them. So uh, we tried to interview them about just how they felt about their environmental conditions as well. And so this was a perspective from one of our participants who said um, when he was in prison, um, he used to walk around with a bag and um, pick up little litters that, and weeds that were around um, and clean up there. And so he talked about just different, different um, things that he had done that, that, were, that would contribute towards um, things like urban forestry careers and stuff coming out. Um, and so that's some of our efforts that we'll be trying to do too, is just looking at um, expanding access to green jobs um, and um, for formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, and we have an example of that at our agency right now. Um, we have a partnership with Caltrans called the Back to Work. Um, and we're um, being able to transition people into getting therapy and getting job placement and training um, and with the partnership with Caltrans, they're able to go and pick up trash along the highways and do some brush clean out and just some plantings to just beautify that area. Okay, and then um, we also, um, if you can see in the pictures, there were little test kits um, around how to test for contaminants in soil and in water and in air. So um, I think this, can probably speak a little bit to the camp in, um, or with our participants. There, these are various quotes around how excited they felt to be able to, um, to be able to test or just understand more about environmental pollutions through that experiential learning. So, um, with one of our participants um, saying, um, for community members, um, it's a one way for parents to bond with their kids but it's also a learning um, experience for the kids as well and something to keep them from being bored. And like maybe in the future, they would think, remember, keep that as a memory and then um, just remember the importance of, and the, uh, just understand more about the dangers of different air pollutants and um, can have the memory of doing that. And then with someone else- Can I given here two minute warning as requested? Oh yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And then another one just saying um, that it's a way for community residents to feel like they have ownership um, because like in the case of Flint, Michigan, that was something that um, maybe like government had known about the contaminants, but didn't um, tell the communities. But if community members had that ability to test their own um, water or air or soil for themselves, they have that extra level of safety. And then um, I'll quickly touch on just community beautification. Um, we were able to um, get a grant to be able to do some um, community tree plantings. And so we um, did a lot of canvassing and, and South Stockton and door knocking to ask people if they wanted to have a tree planted in their yard, uh, front yard or backyard and giving them information about the benefits of planting trees just on air quality, um, saving utility costs, and just beautifying and creating um, a more peaceful um, environment. And then, um, as mentioned, just involvement in the transformative climate communities planning process and um, getting residents involved in creating the sustainable neighborhoods plan and um, AB 617. And so we came up with these six um, kind of like policy recommendations that came out of, um, especially like working with our youth in the interviews around creating more green spaces. So that's definitely something that's aligned with some of what we had with the, um, like the vegetative barriers and the um, pocket parks. Um, increasing access to fresh produce was another. Expanding solar energy and electric vehicles. So I think that one also aligns with some of the SERP uh, measures that we identified, um, cleaning up the air, um, protecting the Delta and expanding access to clean water and then educating youth on sustainable ways of living. So I'll just kind of end there. I wanted to just be aware of time and just make sure um, if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and stop sharing.
but yeah, thank you for allowing us to, allowing me, I guess, to present on our work. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I think she deserves a virtual round of applause with reactions or real hands, whatever you're feeling today. That was really inspiring to see the work that's being done by the center. Um, any questions for Irene? And there's lots of comments in the chat around some of the work that you spoke to and the videos in particular, really exciting, um, exciting work being done and important work being done. If you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I think, um, I think what this presentation really does is two things. One, it gives you a sense of who's on this committee. So if you weren't able uh, or familiar with this community organization before you joined this steering committee, now you have another connection to a potential um, you know, local organization doing fantastic work in all the ways that Irene spoke to. But then also as you're developing your camp and as you're developing the SERP, and really focusing on implementation, thinking about outreach opportunities and partnership opportunities is big. So whether you're thinking 617 or beyond, uh, this is a great opportunity for this committee to think about the network you're building with your community stakeholders um, and people that have passion for the same kind of projects that you do. I don't see any blue hands, but I'm gonna ask Hannah and Kim to keep me honest and make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, any, uh, and, and if we don't have any, that's okay. I think Irene did a phenomenal job and we're, we're ready to move on. But if you do have questions for her, she had put some links of photo voice in the chat. And she's also said that she's willing to answer questions in the chat throughout the evening if you do have a question that pops up in your mind after we move on. Excellent. All right, well, let us move on on our agenda. And again, thank you, Irene, for that fantastic presentation. So now we're going to move to the next um, agenda item, and it's SERP strategy. So we're rolling up our sleeves now. Um, normally, uh, and I mentioned this before, we would be doing a meeting like this in person, um, but we're still social distancing. We're trying to work within the parameters that we have, and I guess I want to thank you again for the flexibility and the patience you've all had with this process. You have been troopers, and your community, again, only met once once or twice before you were sheltered in place. And so, um, you know, we're working through all of these kind of kinks, um, particularly this SERP development process, which is a little tricky. It's hard when you can meet in person and you're doing it virtually. So um, what I'm going to do today is spend a little time at the beginning of this meeting, just giving you an overview of this process that we need to, to take to ensure that we meet the new deadline that you requested for, for March. So if you remember, in December, we sent that letter to CARB and we asked for an extension so we didn't have uh, the deadline of the end of 2020. We've now got three more months, but even those three months are going to be very, very fast paced. And so I want to walk you through step by step what's needed to make this work and meet the deadline. And I want to be as transparent as possible. We're going to establish a roadmap for moving forward and an approach for you so that you have as much time as possible to deliberate, but know that we do have some time constraints. And if we do make some adjustments to those time constraints, we're going to have to have some trade-offs. So my job as facilitator is to keep you on track and help you stay on track. Um, so hopefully you've had a little bit of time over the past six to eight weeks to review the measures that have been sent over. We started talking about them in November and December, so this isn't brand new, but we're continuing the conversation. And if you have had a chance to review them and are familiar with them, that will certainly speed up this process, but it's still getting uh, to be pretty fast. All right, so first things first, let's talk about a SERP refresher. Um, one thing that I know is that, uh, you know, in these processes, you go to a lot of meetings and you have a lot of, of really dense information that comes at you. And I've sat on steering committees, I've facilitated steering committees, and sometimes you forget the basics. Let's refresh. The SERP is the Community Erisions Reduction Program. And the document itself, it's a high level planning document. It's gonna outline basic concepts and community priorities. And we're in that SERP development phase. The implementation phase, which comes next, is when you're going to outline the specifics and the details. And that phase is for five years. And so we're working on the SERP development right now, but it's not as robust of a document as you might think. Um, it's actually a kind of a high level document. And then the implementation part is where you really get nitty gritty. The SERP is dynamic and flexible. That's another interesting thing. Um, I remember, you know, when I was in college and you feel like that final paper, it's gotta be perfect and there's no changes. 
But I will tell you, this SERP is actually a dynamic and flexible document. It's a framework for the work that you're going to do. So even after you get consensus on this SERP by this committee, you can modify the document during the implementation phase. That's really important. Um, there's emission reduction, exposure reduction, and coordination measures in the SERP. And the task of this CSC is to create a document that's going to achieve those reductions through programs and activities that really reflect the priorities that you have. And Irene's presentation is a great example of some of the priorities and the work and the need in Stockton. And I know you know that intrinsically reflect that within this conversation. So the new deadline for the SERP is now in March, but that is going to be the date that the Air District Board votes on it. And then um, when it goes to them, one caveat that's really important to note is it's probably, the document's probably not gonna be all inclusive. It's probably going to be changed. Um, but the document that goes to the board in March should reflect the big staff, the major priorities that this CSC wants to have addressed in implementation. So that's the framework, right? That's where you should be really thinking in terms of that refresher. Next slide, please. All right, so this is the process that we're in. Um, I gave, I've shown this slide before, but I wanted to make sure you were reminded of the roadmap and the steps that are taken to get here. The circled red items, we're reviewing individual measures and we're starting to select the measures that are going to be included in the final search. So those are the two places where we are. And an updated uh, orange box is a reminder that the, the Stockton SERP is now due to CARB uh, by March. Next slide. So we, we were, did a work back schedule. So after December, we sat down and we really mapped it out. We said, okay, here's all the steps that needed to be taken. Even if you guys were in person, these are the steps you'd have to take. You just have to do it in a different format. So we actually looked at the March 18th governing board meeting for the Air District. That's the date they're gonna need to see your document. So we worked back from that. So if you start on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see that you've already begun the process. In December, you began selecting and discussing measures. Today, we're gonna to continue doing that. The next meeting, which is in a couple short days, just on Tuesday, we're gonna continue doing that. But then we're going to start moving very quickly. We're gonna have a meeting in February where we, the Air District's gonna provide a draft SERP to you all in advance. And we're gonna review and discuss that document. It will not have a budget in it. The next meeting in February is the document that will have a budget in it. And during that meeting, there might be some refinement of budget items and moving of, of money around after you've really prioritized what, you, what measures you put in. And then you won't really finalize and vote on the draft SERP until March 3rd. Um, this is assuming that we stick with the standing meeting that are scheduled and any additional proposed meetings if needed. So you see that this February 16th meeting um, where you discuss the, the SERP with the budget, it's a proposed additional meeting and we assume that it will be needed. Um, but again, we're trying to work within the schedule and the time frame with a March 18th meeting to go to the Air District Board. And then that has to go a, few, a week in advance, I believe. So you really need to have your SERP finalized and well, consensus on the SERP March, uh, March 11th. Next slide, please. All right, so with that in mind, this is what the work plan kind of looks like. So today is January 14th. We're gonna review and sort 10 measures. We're following up on the meeting from December, which like I said, feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, about a month ago, we were sorting things. We're going back to sorting guys. But we're just going to sort the yellows and reds today. That's our goal. There are 10 of them. We're going to talk about them. We're going to sort them. We're going to get them into green or move them to red. In January uh, 19th, on Tuesday, we've got to do this again. But for the other 24-ish measures you have not talked about yet, we're going to do the yellow, green, red sorting uh, again for those coordination measures. And we're going to get consensus on those sorting assignments. And then on February 3rd, as I mentioned, talk about the SERP, review it, really make sure you like all the combos you put together. You won't see budget with those. You're just gonna talk about, make sure you like them so that then the next meeting, February 16th, you can see the SERP with the budget and you can make a real like concrete and really uh, thoughtful conversation and decisions to prepare for your vote in March. So that's how the work plan would work to meet the deadline 
for that March deadline for the Air District Board to see your SERP. Um, I'll move to the next slide so that we can make sure that it's all as clear as possible. Um, the sorting process, you've done this already. It's the same as it was in December, green, yellow, red. Um, we're gonna do that again, and we're gonna walk through that again. Um, and again, we've done this based on the comments you've already provided us with. We haven't changed anything since December, so we're just doing the follow-up on the measures we didn't have a time to talk about in December. So we're not uh, gonna talk about the green measures today. We're gonna talk about the yellow and the red measures that you identified at the last meeting. And we're gonna get a little bit deeper into some of the, the, the benefits of, of maybe including those in the SERP and the drawbacks of including those in the SERP. And you're gonna have a conversation with your colleagues and your CSD members about what makes sense and, and why. And we're going to continue with the sorting process, green, yellow, red. The things that end up in green at the end of this meeting, go to the Air District and go into the SERP. And the things that are yellow or red do not. I, uh, I want to flag, I hear a comment and a question. Let me minimize my screen a little so I can see. Um, before I move on, what questions do we have about this process? I don't see any hands. I don't hear anything. Um, I think we're doing okay. Let's keep going. What I will ask of you is that um, and I don't expect you to remember the yellows and reds. We've mapped it out for you, so don't worry about that. Um, and we're gonna keep this um, as fast as possible, but also, again, the goal is to make sure you talk about what you wanna talk about and hopefully get this done on schedule and on time. Here's the disclaimer. We've mapped out this schedule and we've mapped out this process, so we'll know by the end of tonight if we met uh, the goals for today, and if we didn't, we will be fine and we will adjust and we will make sure that this committee gets the time it needs to to make this happen. Um, if we don't meet this time frame and work plan, we might have to add a few additional meetings and those kinds of things. But what I will say is that we're gonna try and work within the schedule we've got. And uh, this group is incredibly smart and incredibly committed. And I know that we have all the things we need to move us forward. Um, I'll move to the next slide, please. Um, and actually, why don't we move, um, let's go Let's go two slides down. Um, before we go into all the strategies in order to give you that refresher and all the colors, keep going. There's one other thing I wanna recall, um, because we're all gonna start this process of actually deliberating as a group. So we're gonna you know, raise hands and get off of mute and, and actually start talking about, about the yellow and red items, which are noted on the screen. Can you go down one more slide, please, Hannah? We're gonna to try to achieve consensus. Um, but the biggest thing I wanted to flag for you all is this, this oh, the next slide, the, is, this, is this process. Uh, nope, the next one, thanks. Um, there are a lot of you on this call. There are more than 20 uh, committee members and a total you know, of over 40 people on the Zoom. And the way that this works in a virtual environment is to be thoughtful about how we communicate and, and how much we're communicating. And one approach we like to take, and I think you've all heard of out before, is the step up, step back approach. If you notice that you are speaking up more than your fellow CSC members, take a step back to allow others the opportunity to have their opinions be represented. And if you notice that you're offering fewer points maybe in the discussion, you haven't really weighed in, step up, speak up. We would love to hear your thoughts and your opinions are valued too. And so as much as you can think about whether you need to step up or step back, we welcome that. I will do my best to also encourage that those voices that haven't been heard get the chance to be heard, but I encourage you all to think about those things as well as we work through this important process. So I will ask if there are any questions and then I will ask Hannah to go back to the list of items, um, the measures in yellow and red, so we can give you that refresher that you need. And then we're gonna begin the process of moving things over to green or red. <laughs> Hannah, can you go back, please, two or three slides? This one? Um, yes, let's do this one. I don't see any blue hands, and I don't see any chat comments with questions. Uh, know that you can ask them now if you have them, um, but I'll keep going until I see one, and I'll ask Hannah and Kim to keep me honest and uh, tell me if you see something that I don't. So this is a list of all the incentive strategies by color. 
The green ones are already in progress. You've already given them the green light, so to speak. The Air District's working on them. They're dropping them into the SERP draft that you're going to see soon. The yellow and red, those were the ones at the last meeting that we didn't feel like were had been talked through enough or there wasn't really certainty that you even wanted them in the SERP at all for various reasons, not because it's not valid, not because they didn't have great um, potential intent, but whether or not you could have the impact you wanted with 617. Maybe the budget was too much. There were some conversations about infrastructure, right? So look at these yellow and red items. And the number in the yellow column, you've got large clean fuel infrastructure, trucks and other heavy duty equipment at the port, car share program, wood burning fireplace, stoves and inserts, electric bike share, truck idling. In red, you've got school buses, trains and other rail equipment, um, tugboats, and marine exhaust. The first question I'm going to ask you all is that you've had a couple weeks to review these and think about these. Are there any items currently in yellow and red that you feel like, you know what, we could probably move those to green. We should put them in the SERP. We don't need to talk about them. Is there anybody that wants to unmute or put in the chat a recommendation for moving anything that's currently in yellow and red over to green? I think Douglas. bike sharing program should be moved to green. You think electric bike share should be moved to green? Yes. Anybody vehemently opposed to that? I just have a quick question for the group too. Is there any chance that you guys might want to combine the car share bike share program into one because the proposal that we sent out that um, some of the partner agencies are looking at, I believe it was the COG or housing authority proposal, I can't remember, actually kind of um, pairs those two things. So um, the same place you would go to maybe, you know, rent your car might also be the same place you could go to pick up a bike or one of several places you might be able to go to pick up a bike. Just a thought. I'm seeing in the chat that uh, the step program, it could be uh, what with SJ COG could be part of that. And then that then Regina thinks that those two could be combined. So two different ideas on the table. One, Douglas is saying move bike share to green, um, and then possibly if we combine them, car share and bike share to green. And Noemi says she's okay with that, especially if it means she could we could spread around with the charging stations. Uh, anybody opposed? Let's talk about opposition. We don't like this idea. Let's, let's tell us why. I see Willie's hand. Willie, would you mind? Oh, sorry. Let's see. Yes, Willie, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question about it. I personally have never used a car share or bike share. I don't know anybody who has. I was kind of curious about if we had data on the actual usage rates of those programs. Um, maybe like an equivalent city or uh, any kind of data metrics that show that people actually use it, that it's a that's a impacting a wide number of people. Uh, Jamie, you're on mute. So as the, um, and I'm I believe it was the housing authority as the housing authority looked to do their proposal now this is that proposal that i sent out that they did not get funded for it was about a million dollar proposal and while they didn't compare it to other cities they did do a survey of residents in sierra vista and conway homes they went door to door and talked to some of the community and they found uh, an overwhelming, uh, I wanna say it was in the 60s, but I'll double check, a percent of the people that they talked to that were interested in it. And when we talked to some of the folks in Conway Homes, uh, they were very interested in transportation from Conway Homes to, um, to even the grocery store is very challenging for folks who don't have a car. And just as a reminder, this isn't like a car rental program like uh, that you'd go to like Hertz or Enterprise. This is a, a, an electric car rental program or an electric bike share program, excuse me, an electric car share program or an electric bike share program where you would sign up to be a member and then you would be able to reserve a car for a few hours. Maybe on Saturday morning, you had to go run two hours worth of um, errands 
you would uh, be able to reserve it and then you would get the car at a greatly discounted rate. rate. So maybe like for like two or three bucks per hour, you might be able to quote unquote share the car. Um, uh, the insurance is actually carried by the housing authority or whoever runs the program. It is not something that you have to carry your own insurance for. And I don't know if Todd DeYoung is uh, our grants or one of our grants focus folks Hi. are on the line. Yep, We've actually I'm here. piloted it in um, both yep. Wasco and a little community called mm -hmm. Cantua Creek. And it's been very successful. It's been uh, very, uh, oh, and Sandy's on the, on the, Sandy can also mention as well. Um, and uh, it, if anything, the fact that we've had to scale it back during COVID has been a huge impact to that community. Todd, do you wanna just explain a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was gonna chime in. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we have had experience over the last couple of years running a couple of pilot programs, car share, um, electric, electric car share programs. And they've been hugely successful. Um, COVID hit us right as we were, we were hitting our stride, and so we did have to take a pause, um, you know, for health and safety reasons on some of those. But you know, prior to COVID um, shutting shutting them down for a period of time, um, even in some of these you know relatively small communities, we had up to 250 active users um, in the system, and and they would use them for everything from. Um, like Jamie was talking about, um, you know, uh, shopping, um, you know, trips to the doctor was a huge one. You know, they couldn't get from these rural communities to Bakersfield or to Fresno, um, you know, to to see the doctor. And and um, oftentimes it would be multiple people um, um, taking one car, you know, one of these larger vehicles, and and you know, making a trip into Fresno for several hours and coming back and. And the the you know the cost to the residents is is very reasonable. I, you know it's a few bucks an hour um, um, to have access to these. You know um, I think in some of the in some of the programs we were using Tesla, the Tesla Model X, um, and we have uh, some Chevy Volts. Um, excuse me, the Bolts. Um, and so it, it, you know we've had we've had uh, very good luck, and and these programs have been. Um, very well received in the communities in which they've been been piloted. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Todd, for that insight. So a couple of things I'm noticing in the chat. So Erica, real quick, if we can let Sandy from the Housing Authority maybe just say a couple of words about, we did share with the group, but it's been, a, it's been since before Christmas, feels like longer than that, but um, what they were hoping to do that they did not get the, they didn't get the grant for it. It was very competitive. So if Sandy can just chime in and, and talk about what they were hoping to do sure. and didn't, but what they could do in this space, that would be great. Sure. Um, we worked very, very hard on this. It was part of the grant we got. Um, we got the uh, Jobs Plus grant. And one of the things that came out of the, from the residents was transportation was a huge need. And so one of the things that we did was work towards a solution for that. And the idea was, it, and to the point of Todd's point, was being able to get, be able to pick a child up from school who was sick, any of those kinds of things. And in, in the proposal or the, uh, that we had sent in, we compared the cost of a car share to Uber. And it is much, much less to do the car share. Um, to get from either Sierra Vista or a Conway up to Walmart, um, on eight mile, it could cost you $25. And, and so the idea behind this is to come up with an affordable way that people could have access in quite frankly, what is a transportation desert? Um, if, you, if you go over to Conway, any, any of you who are down there, it's a transportation desert. And to be able to get to where you need to be and, and to Todd's point, two or three people being able to uh, get it with the proposal that we, we have and we're uh, partnering with Green Commuter who, who is in this space and is an expert at this. Um, they carry the insurance. They they are the ones that keep up the equipment. So they, you know, if there's a problem, it 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 falls back on them to to do all of that. So and to your point, um, when we started, Jamie is uh, literally pre-COVID, and then we finished post-COVID. Talked to um, 170 folks to say, hey, what is it? And we because part of the uh, the grant that we had to put in. So what happens is it's you go in and and, and it's time stamped and. Basically, it's first come, first serve, and we didn't make it in. We literally got ours in at, at 9.02, and we were number 26, and they only had enough money for 28. 
or for 18, I mean. And, and so the idea behind it was that they very, very um, strict guidelines for the CMO of what you had to put in. It was community involvement, community meetings, getting people's input. What do you want? How do you want it? And so the program that we developed that the proposal was around was exactly what the members of the community said they wanted the program to be um, in terms of accessibility and, and those kinds of things. And uh, the additional thing is it also allows people within the community to use the charging stations as well, which I know is something that's important to this group. Um, so for example, while the community cars are, you know, the car shares could be um, charged, there also are more uh, than enough charging stations that people in the community could use them as well. Thank you, Sandy. That is really, really important background. And I'm noticing in the chat that there is a quite a significant amount of support that I'm seeing, at least in the chat, for the car share program. Still a little concern around the infrastructure related to the bike share program. So um, while I do think that the info you provided, Sandy, is definitely helping nudge people uh, to moving the car share over to green, I'm seeing a little more hesitation around the bike share program moving to green. Um, I see Matt Holmes as a hand, and then uh, I think Willie, I don't know if this is an old hand or a new hand, but uh, Willie's hand's up still too, so we'll take them in those in that order. I was just curious if Jamie knew anything about um, the COGS strategy for integrating those two things. Like sometimes those are really different vendors. Um, I, I don't know, I just, there. And Sandy, there's a couple my that work people to answer this, I know the COG has a program that was not as targeted, and I believe the COG actually got funding, but the, it's my understanding the COG program goes beyond the boundaries of Stockton AB 617. Sandy, I don't know if you know anything. Yeah, about that's that. correct, and, and the idea behind it was that they would also, um, so for example, they had other partners that they were including, and it, and it was, um, it wasn't as targeted. Ours, obviously, because we're a housing authority targeted, our, you know, housing authority residents. Um, but they they were going to have multiple partners across multiple um, about multiple venues. So, for example, they were they had been talking to RTD and some of those other things. Great, thank you. Thanks for that question, Willie. Yeah, I and then Douglas, I see you next. Yeah, I just had a follow up to that. I, um, you know, with a. In surveying the community and asking if they'd be willing to drive a, a Tesla, um, I, I, I'm not surprised at a 60% um, interest rate. So I, I think we should definitely take a look at those numbers there. And then second piece is, um, the second part is um, I wanted to uh, call out the, there's no end in sight with COVID. So I don't know what that means for approving this particular initiative and not having a resolution to COVID and how many people would still be willing to do a car share, um, bike share program. Um, and it, does that mean that the cost of sanitizing each between each use um, is more expensive? And then third piece, like I, I, I hear you with uh, talking to community members and hearing, uh, I don't know, 250 people interested and whatnot, but for the cost of getting a, a Tesla or maintaining that, I don't know if it's the best bang for our buck. Um, I'm not saying whether it is or it isn't, but I, I just want to call that to the people's attention that the return on investment there and the number of people we're actually going to impact for the amount of dollars that it's going to take to implement that program is going to be quite a bit. Willie, um, just so you know, the program we're, we're suggesting was not Tesla's. The uh, green commuter uses uh, Chevy Bolts and Nissan Leafs. So just so you know that they're, they're, they're a very different uh, model that, that green commuter uses for this program. Yeah, and, and, and the the Tesla was sort of a one-off because they, they wanted, at the time, it was the only seven-seat all fully electric vehicle that was, that was eligible to be considered a van pool. And so that's why they used the Model X in that case. Um, certainly, there could be other options. Thank you, guys. So I want to do a really quick time check. It's 6.02, and uh, we want to kind of be done with these this entire sorting exercise, don't kill me, by 6.40 so we can talk about the camp. So I'm giving you that time check because I don't want you to be mad at me when I tell you to please speed up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to take Douglas and then Margo, and I'm going to continue to take comments in the chat, and then we're going to make a decision about car share after these two comments. Well, uh, I just we saw the meeting last Tuesday from the city of Stockton, and, and I just received a, a mail 
to, in, to invite for a, what they call a, in the general plan, uh, improving our income in central Stockton, city of Stockton, hosting a virtual opening house to sh share information to the Center Stockton Road Diet Project, which all pro provide bike lane on Monte Diablo, uh, Avenue, Partilla, Acacia, Main, Madison uh, Street, and Fremont Street, part of the project, including removal of the parking, one parking fee, uh, and everything else. So uh, I was just saying that, um, you know, we, if we, if we, if we're talking about expense and things like that, don't the, just letting that, the, 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 the you know, the general fund of the plan of the city of Stockton are more open for suggestion as well to see where we could get other uh, uh, avenue besides that. You know, I, you know, I just pick, I just click that topic and nobody wasn't talking. So I just kind of pick that topic. Hopefully it will start something to generate, whether it be a bike sharing, like same thing if it be with the green, I'm more concerned about, I, I, my, my priority is the green, a green area. But as far as my concern, my concern is that when you put the tree in, I bet if they're gonna have what do you call a sprinkler available to keep it keep it maintained, keep it up, not just just put it there and and just let it die for no for, for no trimming, no care, and all that. That can also is another spend as well. So people are need to look at the, their other other expenses as well as insurance. You know, someone could climb on a tree. So. I understand that it's a lot of pros and cons when, when it comes to trying to solve a problem with gas and emission as well, but it costs money. So that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. You are absolutely right. Thank you for that, Douglas. And I see Ryan has his hand up and then we'll take a, we'll take a movement on this measure. Yeah, real quick, and, and this is a, one of those good examples of what um, Erica was talking about earlier and the flexibility with this. I mean, understanding that this is a, a five-year implementation period, there's a couple of different options. I mean, if, if right now the current infrastructure, uh, a bike share program, maybe a lot of people don't see it being able to be done right away. Um, there, there's the possibility of not including it now and if things change over the five years and, and, and uh, the committee then wants to look at it, it could then get added. Uh, alternatively, you can look at it now, don't prioritize it as far as like when we begin implementing individual measures and just kind of saving it. Uh, and then if, if it does open up that opportunity, then you know we could then work on it with the committee on, on um, implementing that measure. So th those are just a couple of options. Understanding you have that flexibility if that uh, you know changes anybody's opinions or uh, thoughts on on whether to uh, try to include it or not include it. Sounds good. There are a couple of questions in the chat, and I'm hopeful that our our experts in uh, from CARB and the Air District can answer some of the specifics, or, and maybe even Housing Authority can answer specifics about the car share program. But in general, what I am seeing is a consensus that we like the car share program moving over to green. If you are absolutely adamantly opposed to that, now's a good time to raise your hand. Um, the bike share program, we have a little less complete support for. Interest, definitely. Concern about infrastructure, concern about usability, um, and feel that the car share program might be better. But to Ryan's point, there is some flexibility to consider incorporating it now and or uh, moving on it or adding it at a later date in that five-year implementation window. So um, I am going to say, at the, for tentatively, unless I hear otherwise, we're moving car share to green and we're gonna show you an updated version of this. Kim's actually behind the scenes taking notes. Um, we're gonna move car share to green based on the comments I'm seeing. And we're going to hold on bike until I hear uh, something definitive, but I'm going to uh, move us down to the other eight items on this discussion list. Great. Yep, yep, Nate and Stacey are agreeing. Thank you for that. I feel like we're on good soil there. Okay, now we're gonna go in order. Unless there's another one that somebody wants to tackle, we're gonna start with the yellow number one, which is large clean fuel infrastructure measure number 10. Um, if you need a refresher on what this item is, we're happy to give a quick overview. 
Um, but did anybody have any thoughts on moving large clean fuel infrastructure that measure specifically over uh, to green or taking it out and put it in in red? Do we need a refresher? Do you want a couple 30 second overview? Yes, we can, Taylor. Uh, Hannah, do you want to give us a quick one on that? Yeah. Yes. What, so you didn't memorize everything, guys? <laughs> <laughs> So refresher to double check refresher on why this measure is in yellow or refresher on what that measure is because. Um, I, I, this is Todd from the Air District. I can certainly give just a quick update on what the actual measure would be, um, if that would be helpful. Maybe start okay. there. Okay. Um, so this is really, this supports like clean truck um, deployment um, within and surrounding the community. So, you know, if if um, impact of, of trucks is a concern to the community, what this would do is is this would allow us to um, install clean fuel infrastructure, whether that be electric charging for heavy duty trucks or um, alternative fuel, natural gas fueling station, and that would really support truck deployment at at facilities in the area. Um, you know, if there are if there are particular um, warehousing operations, the port, um, you know, where there's a lot of truck traffic, um, this infrastructure would support um, the cleaning up of those trucks. So it would it would allow us to build that infrastructure that would support the deployment of of clean trucks. And Hannah, maybe 10 seconds or 30 seconds on why it was yellow. Yeah, so we've seen uh, some of you supported this measure, some of you kind of prioritized it low. Um, overall, you support installation of large clean fuel infrastructure, but there was there is a need for more discussion regarding types of, of fuel. And you also said, like, don't spend this money on plan planning or make sure we don't incentivize dirty forms of upstream energy. So that's why it's in yellow. And I see a hand from Margo. Margo, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, I just had a quick question because um, does it imply only at the port? Um, I mean, are we, are we looking at clean fuel infra infrastructure where other trucks that go through our city constantly can replenish or is it just the port we're talking about here? Because if it's just the port, I really thought we were hoping that the port would um, step up and look for grants for things going on there. So I, I don't think this is necessarily just related to the port. I mean, I think this would, you know, this type of infrastructure would support um, any clean trucks that would that would fuel at it. I, you know, one of the things that we're um, that we're doing is really a statewide initiative is is trying to increase. Um, the number of, of alternative fuel fueling stations so that, um, you know, range anxiety is not an issue. Um, fleets understand that they have uh, fueling infrastructure to um, run, their, run their fleets, you know, throughout the state. Um, and so it, as, as part of building out that infrastructure, you would, um, you would attract local fleets and you would also attract fleets that, you know, are, are passing through the area that would utilize that fueling station. Um, but it's really, it wouldn't be restricted to one particular fleet or one particular entity. Because I, I really think it's an important thing. I would make it a green just because I do think that truck stops should be outfitted with this type of infrastructure. And I will remind you all, uh, one thing that this, you know, the numbering system is a little confusing, but when you originally prioritize these, uh, the measure number is actually the order of the priority. So it was in the top 10 for you originally, and that might um, help remind you that you thought it was important. Um, I see Matt's hand. Hi, Matt. Hi, uh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I I like the idea of the big bang for the buck that we could get with some of these measures as far as reducing emissions, but we don't really have a lot of information about that. And you know, if we had more information about that, I might feel better about funding industries that are already making their own money. And so I think we still need to wait on information coming in on these things. And I, I had the benefit of being in a meeting with CARB earlier today where they're developing a cost benefit tool about these emissions reduction strategies. And, you know, I shared with them that it's really difficult being in one of these early communities to make these decisions without that information. 
And so I, I think, I think these are probably going to be good ideas, but we need, they need, we need more information to evaluate them. And so for that reason, I would um, move my fellow committee members to um, keep them as low priorities until we have more information to make a more informed choice. Hey, hey Matt, it's Ryan. I think that you, you bring a great point up on a lot of the, the different things that, that we're talking about right now. There, there's a lot of information that's still being gathered, a lot of data and research that's being done on, on measures and um, understanding that, once again, what a possible option would be is if we included measures like this, understanding that there's still being information gathered um, that you know during an implementation phase, just because it's in the CERP does not mean that it, 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 it's definitively going to get done. I mean, it, it's stuff that the, the community has identified as, as options to help clean up the, the, the air, um, uh, reduce exposure to residents in the communities. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if the, the information doesn't pan out, that at the same time that the, the steering committee through the implementation phase will be able to um, adjust uh, accordingly. So, uh, you know, just... Um, yeah, so Brian, with that, a, in, a good plan. with that in mind, is it safer to have it in the SERP or to not have it in the SERP? What would you recommend? To put it in this draft and then not do it or to not put it in this draft and add it? It's going to be easier to, to, to have a concept in the SERP right now. And then, so it's kind of on the table for discussion because this, this is the document that both the Air District Governing Board and CAR Board will see. Now, that's not to say that it, it, it can't go through everything that Ryan just said, but we do like to, you know, let the Air District and CAR Board know that, hey, this is important. And it also, I think, you know, it is helpful for CARB to know that this is a priority and we need that more of that information. We need that data. We need, you know, to be able to be better informed as we move to the implementation phase. And, um, because, sorry, this is this is Todd. Ahead. Just just to add one more thing, just, I, I've been reading kind of some comments in the chat about, um, you know, maybe having, you know, the port was supposed to look for, for grants and it, and it sounds like they've done that and they've applied for some grants but but i think it's important to note that what we're talking about here would be dedicated funding um i, I think you know when you're talking about going for some of these statewide grants or or even air district grants generally they're competitive um and there's only a limited amount of funding and not everybody gets funded having money in the serp for something like this dedicated and stocked and takes that guesswork out you know that money is dedicated to to Stockton and it's dedicated to a project in the community that benefits the community. So, you know, the, the benefit of that versus, you know, looking in other areas, sure, there are other areas to look at for these grants, but, but there's no guarantee that the money would be there when it's necessary. Great, thank you for that um, clarification. I see Debbie, Debbie, would you like to make a comment? Uh, I think it's a, I think it's, an extremely important measure that we ensure that that kind of fuel and electric plugins are available for when the trucks are are going to start being on the road. Um, whether it's at the port or at every every uh, truck stock or truck fueling area. The thing is, is um, I mean, that makes a big difference in taking the, the stuff out of the air. And as the state of California moves along on its goals, forcing the diesel, diesel to back off of this and look for other uh, types of clean fuel um, will be ready for it. So I think it's something we really need to put in the green and we can address how it's going to be done at a later date and how Thank much you for that, money's going to be put to it and all that. 
Thanks for that feedback, Debbie. And I, I want to get a comment that's in the chat from Nate. He said, given the current and continuing development of heavy duty electric and bus charging, she would hold off and keep this in yellow, um, but keep it high priority. So, and I'm not sure you had a clarifying comment. So I'm going to ask you, Nate, to unmute and can tell us what you meant on which one stays in yellow, um, trucks and other heavy duty equipment or the large clean fuel infrastructure. And then Kevin, I see your hand. Uh, do you want to comment in a second as soon as Nate unmutes? Sure. Thanks. Yes. Can you hear me now? This is Nate. Hi, Nate. There you are. Hello there. Yes. Uh, I was talking about the large clean fuel infrastructure. Uh, having uh, having been RTD's uh, director of planning until just a year ago and having much more, probably much more practical experience with electric transit buses than almost anybody else in the U.S. So despite how many electric buses you see out there, they're still working on getting the real gold standard reliable charging method, like charging in the garage versus charging on the street versus induction versus other types. I would recommend I think it's I think the only way you're going to convert to large vehicles is with this infrastructure, but I think this infrastructure needs another year or two to get standardized before you put a huge investment in it. Thanks for that. So again, and uh, and I want to give Kevin a chance to chat, and then I also want to remind you all. So you said in two years, and to Ryan's point, that you can put it in the SERP and not act on it. So if that is a high priority. You might want to keep it in the SERP, but then not not assign money to it until you have more technology clarification, um, and really make sure you're not on the bleeding edge of technology, but maybe on on the cutting edge or or understanding what that new technology and the right way to do it is. Um, I'm hearing that, but I want to make sure I reflect it appropriately. Kevin, close us out on this con on this uh, item before we move to the next one. Sure, this is Kevin Hamilton with Central California Asthma Collaborative, and also a member of the California Clean Freight Coalition and uh, Advanced Clean Trucks uh, Coalition. Uh, so I think the, the best statement I've heard so far was the idea of putting in the SERP and not funding it. I think the, the big, big thing that people need to be considering here, quite honestly, is you've got scarce uh, incentive funding for the SERP effort. So you really have to think about how much money is already there for this. I would love to see the Air District, and I think you've heard me say this before, many of you who I've been working with through this process via email and, and various Zoom meetings, it's critically important that the Air District and Carvis, but especially the Air District, step forward and do a presentation on, with the governor's budget just dropping, on Carl Moyer. So a lot of the money for trucks and other heavy duty equipment and a lot of money for this infrastructure is coming, is in Carl Moyer and another program called Equip, both of which are fully funded and then some this year. So, and then there's another program from CEC that's got a, a ton of money for infrastructure, both hydrogen and electric. Uh, there's some for natural gas as well, but most of it's hydrogen and electric right now. So how much money is already available through those, uh, those agencies that you can bring forward rather than spending the incentive money in the SERP. So I, I think it's really critical to separate out. It's in the SERP because we wanna do it, but we want the money that's already there. We wanna know how much is already there in this multi-million dollar Carl Moyer program. You know, the, and I say millions of dollars in Moyer for this, that's already mandated to be spent only on trucks and uh, diesel engines, mobile sources uh, with diesel engines. So. That's what we need to see, I would think. Everybody would wanna see that. And the only people who can really teach us about that, and especially the current year budget and how that would interact with the incentive findings is the Air District. So, you know, asking Ryan and his team for a presentation there. Hey, Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. We're always interested in providing that type of information, but similar to what Todd had talked about with the dedicated funding. Um, we understand that there is gonna be a pool of money from the state. Um, however, there are concerns with the, the way that it's gonna be distributed. Many of these are first come, first serve. 
um, in which case the money may not make it to Stockton. That would be our biggest concern. Um, and you know what we could look to do would be to apply funding, however, continue to look for additional funding streams um, as an option, but at the same time, still making monetary commitments because in the end, it's about getting the emission reductions in these communities as quickly as possible. Um, we, we know they need it. Um, you know, it, the, that, uh, the data is there, Calenviro screen supports it. There's a lot of emissions reductions that need to happen in the communities. And AB 617 is about doing it quickly. And, and um, so with the, the, the incentive funding, that does allow for that to happen in, in an expedited manner and, and focusing it and, and getting it from the, the sources where that are generating the most emissions. And so, um, I, you know, I think a, a good proposal would be to maybe look at both options. Okay. So thank you all. Um, I, I, we're running low on time and I know Matt, you have your hand up and I wanna be respectful of that. I do see that you wrote something in the chat. Um, the issue here is we, we all agree, I think that this is an important measure. The question is now down to funding. So, you know, it's, I think people want it in the CERP but they don't wanna dedicate funds to it that could be spent elsewhere if there's other funding available. Um, so in the interest of time, I wanna I want say, I think, is that you guys like this measure, you feel like it deserves attention and it deserves to be funded by someone <laughs> and maybe not as, as much by the Air District or by this CSC CERP, uh, but definitely in some way. And to Ryan's point, if you don't get the funding uh, from some other source, you wanna have the opportunity to put some CERP money in for it. So um, I hear, and I'm just scanning through to make sure, um, that if another funding source isn't available, that there's some money allocated to it, but but what that amount is TBD, maybe the Air District team, can you guys work with that? It sounds like we wanna put it in green, it is a priority, but the funding part's gray. Can you give us something that we can look back at next, next meeting that gives us a little flexibility with that? Erica, we have a meeting to talk about budget a ways down the road. So I think if- yeah. We're, we're gonna have a full meeting talking about budget. So I think those conversations can be can be held off. Perfect. So we're going to move clean fuel infrastructure to green. Money won't be talked about yet. Uh, car shares moved to green. Um, electric bike shares still not a great. So we're just, it's kind of in red right now. I want to keep us moving. And I don't, uh, Matt, don't kill me. I saw your hand, but I, I want us to keep going because we got to be done in 15 minutes. <laughs> so we still have a few other items to cover. Um, let's do a really quick bulk assignment, if you guys would do, do, just bear with me. Look at the red column for a second. There are four items there that are red. Are any of those items, do any of them have the chance of moving to green? Because if not, we'll focus the rest of our time on, on, on yellow. I don't see anyone saying school buses, trains, tugboats, marina, maybe rail, says Mary. The trains and other rail equipment operating in the community. Regina agrees. Deep all items in red. Don't wish to move any, keep red. Um, so there, yeah, I mean, I see that there could be some conversation, but most people feel like red is a little bit too hot to handle right now, which means that we're gonna spend our time really talking about um, the yellow items. And I see a thumbs up from Nicholas. Okay. I'm not sure if that thumbs up is related to with Jeff's conversation about marine exhaust or not, but um, uh, yes. Margo, do you wanna make a comment really quick? Yeah, this is about the red items. I just wanna say, I think they're all extremely important. I think we're really hesitant to move them around right now because we're really hoping there, there is other grant money and marine money and other monies to be to go into them. But um, I, I want to, I want us to keep them in the back of our minds. But I, I do see them as staying red. Yeah, I think that seems to be the consensus. So we're going to focus the remainder of our time on yellow. Um, and Jeff, you've got a hand up. I haven't heard from you today. Hi. Hi. Um, 
The only thing I wanted to say is, uh, unfortunately, the timing, I, I think I mentioned in my previous uh, presentation that we're in the process of doing an emission inventory at the port. Um, I got uh, a draft copy last week. And one thing that kind of jumped out at me is the marine emissions. Um, they are probably four to five times higher than anything else on there, including our uh, harbor craft, our cargo handling equipment, trucks and locomotives. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I'm hoping, I'm trying to pull some pieces out of that to be able to share with this group uh, in the very near future. Um, I think I'll at least be, able, it's with the technical advisory committee right now, but I think with the caveat that it's draft, I can probably pull some pieces out. So I just wanted to bring that up and let you guys know that, uh, that you'll see some additional information come from the port soon. Thanks for that, Jeff. All right, so if we are looking at yellow, we've already moved number one over to green. We haven't really talked about number two. Let's talk about trucks and other heavy duty equipment operating at the port and Jeff just, uh, just spoke, so there we go. But let's, um, let's talk about what that measure is and whether any thoughts, uh, do we need a little quick refresher on what it is and where you, why it's in yellow? Okay, quick uh, overview of what it is and why it's in yellow. Oh, I'm sorry, is it supposed to be me? The what it is is probably Jamie and the why it's in yellow is Hannah. Perfect. I, I'm sorry, I, I, you now totally confused me because I, I, and if I'm confused, that's bad. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, can you repeat what you said, Erica? Yeah, the trucks and other heavy duty equipment operating at the port. Can you just give a quick a high level overview of what that measure includes? Yes, that would be to expedite uh, changing out both heavy duty trucks, the drayage port trucks, and um, some of the equipment that operates at the port. Uh, there's, there's a fairly significant source of emissions that are coming out of those. Uh, and some of, they're not all necessarily port owned equipment. And this would be to electrify a lot of that. It's very similar to a measure that I believe Long Beach did. Uh, I believe it was Long Beach. Maybe it was Oakland. I don't remember. In their service. It was, it was both. Oh, okay. There you go. And then Hannah, Hannah remind us Hannah, why it's in yellow. Have, Hannah, didn't you have a chart or something that you were going to share? Yeah, I can, I can definitely uh, pull up uh, a different screen to share real quick so you guys can see. Um, here it is. Okay, so tracks and other heavy duty equipment operating at the port. This is the measure we're talking about. So basically you guys, in your comments, uh, you recognize- uh, Hannah, didn't you have a chart? I think the, the one that I emailed you, Hannah. Okay, let me share another screen with you. Sorry, thanks. It's okay. You can guess I have so many screens going yeah, Hannah, here with you. Windows. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is how it comes out in the email. And I, let me see if I can do this for you. Can you see it well? Yeah, uh, we can't see the bottom of the very bottom of the uh, Mm -hmm. the graph so we don't see all the if you can just tell us what we're reading maybe shrink down a well, little you know what let's, I can let's share it we can get no someone else to share it yeah i've got it i no big deal One, lots six. of screen sharing <laughs> can you guys see what i'm sharing here not yet but it's coming up All right, we got. Ryan can walk us through this. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I understand where everybody's coming from with the, the discussion on, on equipment in the red, uh, in the red category, and, and understanding that, um, you know, the desire not to look at, at funding businesses to, to replace equipment. Um, you know, part of this process that I know isn't easy is, is the, the I, is that decisions have to be made 
for the benefit of the people that live in the community. And, and what AB 617 at its core is about, and that's about getting emission reductions in the community. Um, that and, and, and the health benefits that were, will result from that. And so, you know, what we did was we, we kind of lumped in, if you spend you know, uh, this amount of money, these are the tons of emissions that you will get in the community. Um, now, the, 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 when we talk about incentives for uh, equipment at the port or you know, tugboat repower, these types of programs, it's not a, a situation where these companies would get 100% of the funding to do this change out. Uh, in, in the cases, for example, with our existing programs, companies still have to have skin in the game. They still have to provide money to um, you know, their own funding to, to, to match in, in cases. Uh, the, the challenge is in many cases, what we're talking about there's not a requirement in place that would force them within the time periods that we're looking at to get those emission reductions. Um, you know, the, in some cases, it may be 10, 15 years before someone be, would be required to get rid of a piece of equipment. Um, and and you know, there, there are definitely going to be tough choices that get made through this process. Um, and, you know, what's on us is to provide the, the steering committee with information that they can use in, in making potentially some tough decisions. Like I may not like to give money to certain individuals, um, but understanding that there's a lot of emissions that come from that specific type of equipment and it is operating there. Um, and so what we did here is we, we put together, like I said, just some, some, some general information on, on what you're looking at if we fund these and the emission reductions that you'll get from these, um, which are real, they're quantifiable um, emission reductions. And so um, I, I understand, once again, we understand where the, the steering committee is coming from, the, the desire maybe not to, to look to fund some of this, but I do want to emphasize AB 617 is about getting emission reductions It's in the community. And it, that's what's going to benefit, that's what's going to improve health. So please keep that in mind. Thanks. So this is a really interesting, uh, I think, an interesting graph. So if I'm reading it right, it says that the incentives to replace wood burning devices has the highest emission reductions, followed by locomotives, then rail car, then tugboats, um, and then near zero emission technology at the port and near zero emission technology or near zero emission HD trucks. Those are the top items. Uh, things like lawn and garden and uh, new school buses lower. Am I reading that correctly? Jess, are you on yes. the call? Yes. Yes. Sorry, I was I was on mute. Yes. You oh, are sorry, Jess. No, no, no. Okay. Yes, exactly. So, so you know, and as Ryan said, this was as if we tried to make them equitable so we can kind of compare across the board. And exactly, if you spent the same amount of money in each of these, so $1 million for each of these, this is how much you would get essentially the bang for your buck. Um, so you're right, the, the lawn and garden is lower than something like wood burning devices or some of those heavy duty near zero technologies like the trucks and the stuff at the port, and then especially those locomotives and switchers. Got it. Okay, so that's a lot of information to take in, but skim this. We'll keep it. We'll keep it in front of you. But we're also, Jess, would you mind stopping the share for a second? Um, let's see if anybody has questions. Jeff, I think your hand was up originally. Did you have a different question or comment, or are you good? You're down. Okay. Um, so. You've seen a new chart. Let's pull up Hannah that last the, the sorting document again, um, because that is really a, an interesting indicator. If we're about emissions reduction, which is what the plan is titled, uh, some of the items that we have in yellow and red, some are going to make a big difference and some are not. Um, so Jess, do us a favor if you would, and just read off the ones that are going to have the highest impact. Um, in terms of emissions again? Definitely. So in terms of direct emissions, the highest sort of bang for your buck 
um, in is going to start with incentives to replace wood burning devices. Um, and then from there, the locomotive, pretty much everything that's heavy duty. So locomotives and switcher rail cars um, is, is a lot. I mean, it really, you could replace just one and get all of those emissions reductions that were shown um, in, that, in that chart that we were just sharing. And then from there- So um, Jess, so which number is that that you're oh, looking sorry, at? Sorry, Are you yeah. looking at? So the number, On the, the yellow and red I mentioned screen. is number four in yellow. So that's measure okay. 17. That's the replace wood burning devices. That's really where you get a lot of bang for your buck. And that's just because it's it's not very costly for us to fund those um, types of uh, device change outs. Yet we get a lot of reduced emissions. We're no longer burning wood. Okay. okay, so hold that thought for a second. CSC members, do we have any concerns around moving number four over to green? Trying to see. Comments. If somebody's got a major concern around moving this number four, replace wood burning fireplace stoves and inserts to green, please unmute and tell us. It looks like four looks good. I'm hearing no concerns. I have one. Um, oh, sorry. I don't see you yet. Um, uh, there you go. Go ahead. Jonathan Pruitt. Uh, so I have, uh, I, when it comes to these sort of things, these are things that Air District is known for um, doing their incentive funding parts. It would be nice to see the numbers behind how many they replace each year or how many they've actually replaced, how many they've reached out to in given areas. And especially with each community, each community is different. So like where are the, where's the denominator in these communities? Are they rural? Are they usually just in, in um, like downtown communities or are they communities that are suburbs? Um, where exactly are these located? Yeah, Jonathan, just to quickly answer that question, they're usually in urban areas. And I will tell you right now, uh, Fresno and Kern counties both have a higher incentive dollar amount. We give more money back to people. And that's, what, uh, that's why they've had uh, more, they take more advantage of the program. Have they though? So you guys, so the Fresno has the AB 617 funding um, right now for the incentive. How many have used it so far? Total Valley wide, we're about 16,000 in Fresno. I'm guessing, I don't have that number right in front of me, but um, we could get it for you. Please, I'd like to know by the time this funding started last year, uh, when you guys finished your guys' SERP, how long it took for them to get it replaced. It's, it's, it's a little bit different because it's not apples to apples. Fresno uh -huh. has a $3,000 uh, per our rule, a $3,000 incentive amount. Uh, right now, Stockton does not have $3,000. You can only get $1,000 in Stockton. And that's because Stockton is not considered <laughs> on that spot in the uh, wood burning rule. So that's totally separate from AB 617. Mm. So it's not so really, in the not, chat, can't really making apples to apples comparison there because the rule changes a few things. And, and this is Todd from the from the district. Just to be clear, um, the the specific the AB six seventeen funding um, for burn cleaner dedicated to Fresno um, hasn't actually begun flowing yet. We're we had to take um, the whole program through a process with CARB to get it approved because it it wasn't included in the the community air protection guidelines. So that's going through a process right now, and we hope to soon, um, you know, be moving that funding, that dedicated AB 617 funding. Now, we have our district-wide program, which is what Jamie was talking about, but the dedicated 617 funding for Fresno and Chapter has not started flowing yet. So the vast majority of comments I'm seeing are requesting that we move this one to, to green. Uh, I do see three hands, and I haven't heard from Irene yet today. Irene, what are your, what's your comment? Um, I was just thinking because um, as part of the transformative climate communities next year, there's an organization, um, Rising Sun, that is doing um, home weatherization and retrofits in the same area, the same planning area. And 
where they're like changing light bulbs, changing like water fixtures. So I feel like this is something that if the outreach is usually a challenge, it's something that might they might be able to help out with and include it as another incentive as they're already going into homes and um, like swapping out things. Great, thanks Irene. Um, I'm seeing mostly consensus. I'm gonna talk to, I've seen Margo and Matt. Um, we'll go Margo and then Matt, and then we'll close out this item. We'll move number four over um, to green unless I hear something dramatic that says no, no, no. And I think there's some caveats though. So for the Air District team, there's a lot of specific things in the chat, requests for how to, how to disclaim that move um, because it's not, a, it's not a full green move. Uh, Margo first and then Matt. Thank you, Matt, so much for your patience. And then Margo, you're up. I just want to talk about how important this issue is because um, our air quality has been in the no burn um, section for many days uh, at different times, you know, it comes and goes, but people like to, to use their uh, wood fireplaces and um, they can get cited for that. So just food for thought. I think the idea is wonderful. I think along with a, a notice of a potential citation could go the information about how to get it all replaced would be helpful. And the extra money would be very important. Thank you. Thanks, Marno. And then there is a question, there's a couple questions for the Air District team specifics on how that program works in the chat. If you have the ability to answer, I'd appreciate it. Matt, close us out on this item. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to um, elevate the, you know, Kevin's comment about the wood burning stove. I think it is a good bang for the buck. And I think it's really good that people who, you know, not everybody's coming to these meetings um, this is a great way to impact people right in their homes and right in their lives. I, I, I think it looks like the data is there for this one. I think for the other things that we're debating, like, you know, um, charging infrastructure and whatnot, um, you know, I understand we need to get an approved SERP and that, and that you know, that, but there's still a lot of data out there. So I'm just a little concerned about putting things in the SERP without any guarantee that um, you know, I know we're going to have a budgeting meeting about that, but there, you know, there just needs to be oversight before this money's spent. And I think there's um, reticence among the community that say you throw, you put money in a budget for major infrastructure improvements that that doesn't proceed without everybody's knowledge. And so I, I know we've got everybody on record tonight that um, these things are always going to have community oversight in them. I just, you know, I, I don't know how we can give people more confidence that we're not going to go ahead and spend a bunch of money on something that doesn't have enough data to support it. And so that's something that I don't know how, I don't know how you cover that in writing. Um, I believe you all, you won't go spending all our money without checking with us first, but, um, and, and it's not just, you know, it's not an ego trip. Um, this kind of goes back to our meeting last week. If we don't demonstrate that these decisions and these plans are truly community authored and led, everything that you do is subject to litigation. And that, that throws everything that the Air District is trying to pull off here into question. So um, we're being asked to make uninformed choices and that's a really frustrating thing. So what, I don't know how to get the assurance we need, but we need to figure it out. Ryan, I think you wanted to answer that. Yeah, uh, we understand that the, the 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 trust building is a process that that it's not going to happen overnight, Matt. And you know, I, it, I I'm definitely a, a believer in the, the proof is in the pudding, that we're going to have to demonstrate that and and earn that trust with you know the the residents and the the members of the steering committee. Um, but like I said, I mean the once we're in the implementation phase and and we're working to develop like what we're going to do specifically on these measures that's when we're gonna be talking with the, the steering committees. We'll try to gather as much information as we can like prior to this um, and, and provide it so that you the, there's more comfort. Um, just understand that what you're experiencing right now, it was experienced in Shafter, was experienced in South Central Fresno, was experienced in the, in the, the, the communities in, in South Coast and the Bay Area and other places. It, it's, we're, we're all operating under these crazy short timelines in order to, to, to get a, a community emission reduction program put together. Um, I, I think the main thing that Erica talked about is it, it, the, the, the SERP contains concepts that are gonna be looked at that were, the concepts came from the steering committee members and, and the, the things that they saw in their community 
that concern them. And, and what we've tried to do is identify the, the things that uh, we think could reduce those impacts to the, the, the people living in these communities. And, and that's what we're, we're having these conversations about and, and really focusing on. So, um, like I said, I mean, uh, I, I would love to snap my fingers and have everybody believe everything, single thing that we said, but we understand that, that that's gonna be a, a, a process that we're going to have to, to prove. Thanks for that, Ryan. And I think Matt's acknowledging what you said and recognizing it and appreciating it. Um, Okay, so we got a lot of support for moving uh, number four, the wood burning fireplace stoves and inserts over to green. We're gonna do that and we're gonna keep moving. And Jess was giving us the comparisons between the, the, you know, the real bang for your buck on emissions and which ones were in red, yellow, and green here on this sheet. Before we do that, I wanna do a quick time check. We are over our time. But we have a pretty aggressive agenda for today, and I'm certainly okay to keep going. Are you guys okay to keep going and get through these, these measures? We've got about one, two, at least two yellows, and I think most of the reds are staying in red. Um, but I just want to make sure, let's say we've got about three other measures to cover. Do you feel comfortable continuing uh, this conversation so we can knock this out today and stay on our, our work plan to get us approved by, or consensus, by March. Is that okay? Can I get a thumbs up if you guys are okay? So far I see one, some virtual or otherwise, however you feel. Yeah, I see some thumbs up. Okay, we're going to go as fast as we can um, to keep it moving. Thank you guys. And um, Regina, I see your hand up. I want to make sure that's not a thumbs up. If it's a thumbs up, hand up, that's great. Regina and Nate, are you saying yes or you have a comment? Thumbs up, got it, perfect. Okay, we're gonna keep going and we're gonna go as fast as we can. We're gonna go over time. Don't hold me, uh, don't hold it against me. Jeff, yes, Erica, keep us going. Yeah I'm, good Hi, until Nate. yeah, I'm good until 7.15 and then I have an absolute unbreakable family commitment. Let's try and get Nate to his absolutely unbreakable family commitment. We're going to try and do this. Okay, Jess, talk as fast as you can. Compare for us um, the next item on the bang for your buck list that you had on that great graph. And, and Hannah, keep the share. If you can go back to that red, yellow, green, let's get back to that list. Um, which is the next on the bang for your buck that if we did it and put it in the SERP, yes. that it would get us the next highest level of emission? That would be definitely the trains and other rail equipment operating in the community. Those are ones where um, even replacing one will get us, um, uh, you know, so much. It would get it would get us reductions that are equivalent to replacing, um, you know, hundreds of wood burning devices. Um, so I, I rail car, um, it, it kind of encompasses all the different types of rail operations. Would definitely be the next bang for your buck. All right, CSC, tell me how you feel. It's in red. It is very red. Um, it's not very red, actually. It's number twelve, but there is some concern, um, and and you know specifically. Let's see, moving. Uh, I'm checking the chat. Specifically, um, you know, there's some concern about whether this committee should pay for anything related to rail. I've certainly heard that. Um, anybody want to speak up and talk about you know thoughts about moving that, knowing how much the emission reductions would be? I'd like to. This is yeah, Deb. go ahead, Debbie. Um, I know Jeff was going to get us information that covered most of these four items that are in the red uh, in order for us to decide to make a decision on them. Um, he was going to get us more information and what was going on with these specific uh, areas. I I thought that's what I understood. This was several meetings back, but because we had asked him for more information on, on these issues. Yeah, and I think he did mention marine exhaust is coming. Uh, Jeff, did you want to make any comments on that? Yeah, I can just say that, um, so the table that I'll be able to share and pull, and, and as much as I can get from the technical advisory committee, I'll share. Um, and it will show all the different categories, all the emissions for all the five different categories, including locomotives, uh, cargo handling equipment, ocean going vessels, harbor craft, and on-road on -road, uh, emissions as well. I can have that to this group, at least the table by the end of this week, which is tomorrow. So 
I should be able to share that with you tomorrow. Okay, um, so with is, that in mind, go ahead, Todd. Sorry, this, is, this is Todd from the district. Just, just to add a little bit of context here, I've been kind of monitoring the chat. Um, and I think what, what this strategy, what we heard early on was that, you know, line haul locomotives, you know, don't stay in the area. You know, UP, BNSF, um, they fly through and it's impossible to sort of um, make sure that the benefit stays in the community. What, what this, what this um, measure is really focused on are the, the short line um, and the switchers. Uh, there's multiple short line operations in the area um, of Stockton. We've actually, over, over the years, we've actually replaced a couple of switcher locomotives. Um, and just to give some context, switcher locomotives are generally line haul locomotives that are on their last legs. I mean, we've replaced some switcher locomotives from the 1940s and 1950s, um, which they're, they're just hugely impactful when you're talking about emission reductions going from um, a 1940s diesel engine to a hybrid or um, you know, super clean diesel locomotive, switcher locomotive. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what we would be talking about with this measure is those, those switcher, those short haul um, locomotives that are gonna be staying in the area. Um, and again, we've done a couple um, throughout the years and they've been hugely successful. They're about the most cost-effective project that you can do um, in terms of emission reductions. So just to give a little bit of context. Thank you for that. And Kevin just put something in the chat that investment in local pusher and switcher replacement is a great benefit, uh, money well spent, interesting context here. Uh, anyone else pro or con? Do we like this? This is a, this is a good emissions reduction strategy. Um, and given that it stays local, does that change your mind? Just one other quick point. Um, the railroad companies are really unique in that they, uh, they have a lot of autonomy. Think back to like, you know, the railroad companies from the turn of the last century, not 20 years ago, but 120 years ago. And it, it, they are regulated uh, primarily on a national level, although CARB is beginning to discuss what can be done about them. Um, so regulating them or getting them to uh, make some of these clean air decisions uh, you know, by force is really challenging to do. I, I, Jonathan, you're reading my mind. What do my residents think about this? I see Margo and Debbie on my screen and Nate. I've already, I know I've heard from some of you. Uh, are there other residents that feel strongly about moving the uh, train and rail, local train and rail over? I'd be good for moving it from red to yellow. <laughs> well, right now we need to get things to green. So yellow lives in a purgatory at the moment. So green goes into the SERP. Yellow is, uh, you know, yellow is just not really anything. Holden red for now says, Nate, can we create a purple? <laughs> Matt, you're killing me. No, we may not create a purple. No more colors. <laughs> no more colors. Um, any others? Red column is red, Stacey. So residents aren't loving it. Railroad stays in red. We're not going to belabor it. If you change your mind, let me know. Um, I, Jeff, I think keep it. Excuse me. I think we're waiting. I think we, if once we hear from Jeff, uh, say on Tuesday, we can make those yeah. decisions quick. Okay. That's a fair. That's a fair. That's a fair hold. So Jeff's going to get us some stuff tomorrow, or the committee is going to get some things tomorrow. We promise by the end of the week. So. We'll hold on red. We've got a meeting on Tuesday. We can talk a little bit about it on Tuesday. Um, so Jess, can you talk to us about in order of emissions reduction in the yellow, what's left in the yellow, um, what's the highest thing for our buck? Um, from I there, think the like, last. Yeah, I was gonna say the from there, um, zero near zero technology at the port. Um, if we're talking about, I don't know, earlier I know we kind of touched on it a bit. I don't know if it's, staying in the yellow for now, but that's definitely the next bang for your buck. Again, those heavy duty emissions um, from various different types, as Jamie explained earlier, uh, definitely get you the, an, a really good amount of, of emissions reductions. So that's the number two, which is trucks and other heavy duty equipment? Correct. All right. We didn't really have total consensus on that one. 
any changes in your in your in your brain in your heart and soul on this given what you've heard about the emission reductions Hearing none, I think we're a little gray. Okay, I'm gonna give you time to percolate on that. Jess, talk to us about number six, which is truck idling plugins. I saw that on your on your graph as well. Um, how does that fare? Actually, this this actually isn't on our graph. Um, so I can have maybe Todd explain a little bit, just to kind of go over what it is. Um, it's um, but yeah, it's not something that we have here. Um, and I'm I'm guessing maybe Todd, it's not. In, in comparison to these measures, just anecdotally, not a, a huge bang for your buck in comparison, I, maybe. I have to apologize. I was reading the, the chat comments, which, which- Number six, truck idling plugins, which I believe would be to prevent idling to run maybe like the TRU engine. That's correct. Yeah, it's, it's basically shore power for TRUs. Um, these are installed um, um, generally at distribution facilities or any places that trucks queue up for a long period of time. Um, it allows them to shut down their diesel engines and operate their, their TRUs, their transport refrigeration units um, to keep their loads cold um, without running the diesel engines. That's what that is. So that doesn't, to your knowledge, have very strong emission reductions potential, it sounds like you're saying. Um, and it was measure number 26 on your list in terms of priority. So it was a new ad, so maybe not a ton of community steering committee support to begin with, it was pretty low. It was actually a late ad, if I recall, and so it didn't really get prioritized. Um, uh, yeah, to Matt's point, another one where the devil may be in the details, and the details weren't really thought through, it sounds like, because it wasn't brought in at the same time as some of the earlier measures. I feel like it's moving to red, unless I hear otherwise from you all, um, but it's not great on emissions, and I don't think we had a lot of support from it for it. Um, so number six, moving to red. I see oh, no, Regina wait minute, approving. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Margo, Margo has her hand up. Sorry, Margo, let's, let, tell us about it. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I wasn't sure what, I might have even thrown it on there at one time because I thought trunk, truck idling was one of our larger issues, especially in the Boggs track area near the port. There were lar uh, many trucks in a queue idling. Um, I didn't realize it was for the, TRUs, I didn't realize it was that specific. Um, I just know that our area gets extreme, can get extremely cold in the winter. We certainly haven't seen that this year. And it can get extremely hot in the summer. And as truckers sit in their trucks, they need to idle for their comfort. So my thought was that it would be some type of temporary fix that would allow them not, not to idle. They could be comfortable without it. If there's a way that the that logistics could accommodate queues, which is really important and should be doable, it might solve the problem. But I think these plug-in, if if there are so, I didn't even know there were such things. If there are such things, I think they could be a really important small issue for us. You know, I don't know what they cost. I don't. You know, maybe it's a minor thing that that allows for a lot of. Um, not having to idle. I don't know if Todd has more information about the idling aspects and is our area more prone to that than other areas like in the Bay Area or something. But um, I thought it was really interesting and it's something we have not talked about much. I, you know, I think generally wherever you see um, um, a high number of trucks congregating in one location, so areas that have a high High number of distribution facilities, you know, obviously you're going to have a lot of truck idling. So wherever those, you know, wherever those facilities are located, you know, the truck idling is going to be an issue. And are there such portable kinds of things that would, um, could be shared by the different trucks so that they didn't have to idle? Is that what this is? Um, or is, is it one at a time at a, at a queue in location where they can plug in and keep their TRU function. Is that what it yeah, is? It's well, a yeah, huge gen cost? Generally what these are, are it, it's a bank of, of plugs. You know, you'd have 20 or 30 um, in a row that could be used by 20 or 30 trucks that are waiting, that are queued up waiting to deliver their, their goods or whatever. Um, and it does allow them to, um, 
um, operate their TRUs. Now there there is actual technology um, um, that that allows them to run their um, their hotel, um, you know, their their internal truck um, um, functions as well, uh, heating and air conditioning, so that they can keep comfortable um, while they're waiting in their cab. So you know that's all that's all part of it. So it it's not specifically just for TRUs. Um, there, there is an application where you, where you actually run um, a lot of the, the truck, you know, comfort and, and convenience. And what if, the, say, say we're talking about the port, what if the port mandated no idling more than what, five minutes or whatever, would, what would the cost be for these kinds of things? It does not sound very costly. Um, overall, they're not, you know, they're not super costly. Um, I, I can't speak to um, uh, um, idling, anti-idling regulation, um, but overall the, the installation of these, you know, depending on, on the scale and the location and the infrastructure that would be necessary to support the, the electricity, um, you know, they're, they're not the most expensive measures, certainly. Then I, I'd like to suggest that we move this one to green and do a little more research on it and not move it right to red. And if the port has some logistics concepts that they can share with us that might work easily for this kind of an idea. I mean, this might be temporary until we have um, electric trucks, but, but I, think, I think it could be important for, for, the, for the residents in the area. Okay, you've heard Margo. Thumbs up if you like that idea. I'm seeing a couple thumbs, Debbie, Mary Elizabeth, some residents, yep, Marco, certainly, yes, Dylan. Any other thumbs up you wanna share? Let's see, yep, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, okay, we have certainly some flexibility on this, friends, so we can move things if we need to. I hand, there we go, so I think that's the last measure that we need to cover. Number two, gosh, sorry, number two, yellow two. Trucks and other heavy duty equipment operating at the port. We haven't made a decision on this one yet. And I think that's partly because it's a port conversation and you're gonna get some insights from uh, our friends at the port tomorrow. So that kind of moved to red until we have that info. Um, but it looks like what we've got so far is number one has moved to green. Yellow number one has moved to green. Yellow number three has moved to green. Yellow number four has moved to green. Yellow number five has moved to red, and yellow number six has just moved to green. Everything else is pending additional insights tomorrow from uh, the port research, and then we're gonna talk about it and make some really fast decisions on Tuesday after you've had a chance to absorb what's provided by our friends at the port. Does that sound like what we've heard and said? I'm seeing nods from Debbie. Anybody's like, ah, no. I don't, I don't like it, I can't, I need something else from this list in red, yellow, green that you see right now. Because we're gonna take this and run with it at least until Tuesday. Okay, we promised we'd be done by 7.15. So you're gonna see the fastest possible transition over to a camp conversation. Um, you guys are real troopers. I feel like you deserve a round of applause for just getting as far as you just did in the last few minutes, man. You guys did so well. This is huge, so you are just amazing. Thank you for that. All right, let's move over to the camp. So here's the deal on the camp. We, this is a fast agenda item actually. Last meeting, two meetings prior to that, you said you had some concerns about the verbiage in the air monitoring plan. And so what the solution to that is was to keep parallel paths. The air district is moving forward. Authorize, you've authorized them to do some preliminary work on some site approvals and reach out to properties. And now you're gonna do some actual kind of wordsmithing on the camp language itself as a CSC. This last item is really about putting together a committee to do that. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to the Air District team for some more insights on that but, and the process for it. But we wanted to reflect the, the wishes of this committee to have a little more deep dive conversation so you feel really, really great about the camp. Uh, from the Air District, would you like to unmute and tell us about this process? Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Erica. Hey, everybody. This is John Klassen with the Air District, and I'll be real, real brief with this. And Erica already gave a, a nice summary there, but uh, 
Just to go back and remind us at our November steering committee meeting, we discussed the Stockton Community Air Monitoring Plan in, in, in some detail. Had a good discussion there with everybody and the steering committee uh, took action to recommend that we go ahead and implement the network design itself. Uh, the committee was okay with the locations that we had worked on together. So we've been taking a few steps to start organizing some thoughts on specific uh, properties that we might be able to work with within each monitoring zone that the committee recommended for monitoring. So we've done some organization there. Um, we've already done some preliminary monitoring John, with, our, with our mobile. John, yes. I'm sorry for, for interruption. You're talking too fast and my interpreter is trying to catch up. Can you mind slow down a little bit? I, be, I know that, it, you know, Erica and everybody is running so fast. Quick, I'm I'm it's, I'm getting an, an, I'm overwhelmed of people talking so fast. Can you? I'm trying to catch up. Okay, so that's all. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Doug, for that. I'll, I'll slow down a bit. Uh, I did want to mention too that uh, since we talked about community air monitoring in Stockton, we've done some initial work already with our mobile air monitoring ban near Washington Elementary School. We did some work there. Uh, last month in December, and we'll keep doing some work in the area in those different um, zones that the committee recommended while we continue to work on getting um, the approvals to put uh, equipment at different properties and, and locations across Stockton. So we'll continue that work and we'll keep you updated as we continue to work on that. But as Erica said, this committee, if the, if the committee here wants to form the subcommittee, we'd like to work with you specifically to get the specific recommendations that you might have on specific properties or locations within each zone that the committee recommended monitoring to be at. So we, we want to work with you on that um, to narrow down exactly what we want to do. We've already had some good recommendations on schools in the areas through the discussions that we've had. You may have some different thoughts on different properties that could work um, that's in a good location. So we want to work with you on that before we move forward with, with uh, trying to get lease agreements in, in place with any of these properties. So that's something we can work on. And then the language in the in the SERP to, in, in the camp too, um, we can work on that together if, if the subcommittee has some thoughts on how we can continue to implement the camp for Stockton. So that would be the, the point of the subcommittee that, that we're recommending. Thanks, Erica. Thanks. So I think what we will do is uh, you will hear for, if the committee wants to, to create a subcommittee, um, that's the kind of decision for today, and I, and I think we heard in earlier meetings that you did want to do that, and there's certainly activities that can be done. The next step would be for the Air District to reach out to all of you and identify dates uh, and times for that subcommittee to meet, and then you would report back to this committee with the actions that you take during your meeting. So um, I think this is, and I'll, I'll look at Jamie and Ryan for some specifics here, but Next step would be just getting some calendaring done and securing volunteers to participate in those subcommittees. And as a reminder, they're not stipend eligible, but they are, um, they are important work. We'll send out a doodle poll. Fantastic. Yes, we are going to develop that doodle poll coming from the Air District. Stay tuned for more insights and, uh, and we'll continue to have uh, agenda items with updates on that camp in the main CSC meetings for those of you that cannot participate in the subcommittee yourself. Okay, lots of work has been done. We just finished that. We've got four minutes. We're gonna get it done in three. Uh, we're closing in to wrap up and I'm trying to keep track of the chat. I don't see every single thing. So I'm gonna give a little bit of time for a last comment or two uh, for those that need to make one for this meeting. Um, but I did wanna thank you all so much. I wanna thank our community co-host and again, for the next meeting, we will be looking for another volunteer. I want to give our community co-host a chance to uh, to say some last thoughts and uh, to give uh, to give some parting words while any volunteers write their names in the chat or raise their blue hands for a future meeting. Um, no real comments. Just thank you, everyone, for your patience and going over time. Thank you. You're right. It's just you guys did a lot today. Apologies for going over, but you did get a lot done and it was amazing. Um, now we want to check for public comments before we uh, before we take final comments from the committee. Uh, our public comments usually come from our Facebook page and our email. So I will ask Heather if there are any public comments from today. Heather's oh, no Heather today, actually. Heather's not here today. My God, she's never not here. Anyone else from the Air District that's checking on the public comments in the email? <laughs> yes, there's no public comments currently. 
Perfect. All right. Uh, any final comments from the committee uh, or members or others on the Zoom? Raise your blue hand or unmute yourself. And, and we are accepting, oh, I hear someone. No, no comments, okay. Well, we are still accepting co-hosts of recommendations and volunteers for the next meeting. Well, the next meeting is on Tuesday, so we may not have time for you, uh, actually, in hindsight, but for a future meeting, let's just say. Um, and at the next meeting, you saw the work that we have to do. Uh, it's very much uh, a lot of moving and sorting and discussing. And I have to say, you guys have gotten the hang of it, certainly. Um, the data that was provided by the Air District is incredibly important. We're looking forward to getting data from the port to make even more decisions on Tuesday. Um, I believe we've covered everything for today. Any parting thoughts or questions from anyone, now's your chance. Otherwise, it's 713, and our friend that needs to leave at 715, you are good to go. I'm raising my hand. No, I think I'm, I'm raising my hand and I'm unmuted. Hi, yeah, I just I just oh. want to share that um, you know I've been in multiple uh, West Oak or what AB six one seven steering committees and uh, some of the questions that we had tonight have been answered in those communities and I really wish the state and the six one seven office that's responsible for this program statewide had done a better job coordinating air districts to compare notes because. It shouldn't fall onto this tired, grumpy old history teacher to sort out scientific technical problems. And so um, if anybody wants to join me in ranting at the next CARB meeting, uh, I'll type my email in there. <laughs> Thanks for that. Grumpy old history teacher, no, no, but you are right. It's not, um, you know, that doesn't, it's not an ideal feeling. So I, I Matt's put his uh, in, information in the chat. Feel free to reach out if you'd like to commiserate and share that, uh, that, that, that feedback with CARB. Um, and I don't see any others. We are adjourned at 7.14 with a minute to spare. Thank you guys so much for the extra time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Great job. Bye, everyone. Thank you, guys. Talk soon. Kim, let's start. Stop recording and Facebook Live, please.